look now at uh, that beautiful launch uh, that took place uh, here just uh, 23 minutes ago. By videotape, here it is. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I might say, Walter, you used our classic astronaut word, beautiful. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> Roll's complete and the pitch is programming. The other one, of course, we have is fantastic. We can use that later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably will. <laughs> this could be a chance. One Bravo. One Bravo is a abort control mode. You know, actually, we, watching on television, uh, get a much better view of the thing Altitude with that long-range camera than uh, than you can watching from the beach. Uh, we watch here, both on the oh, on the video, too, uh, as uh, you're watching at home. But we also look through our glasses and uh, binoculars. Three, and four miles now. Far the better view is by television. Uh, well, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. That's what's spectacular. It really is. That thing's 100 miles high. Incredible. I can recall when we found out it was uh, necessary, in fact, for us to uh, fly chase aircraft and follow the booster to see if there's any We're anomalies that might be worth reporting. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a real-time decision, but we could see if some calamity might have been developing. Well, I thought you were just range, 12 miles high. really flying Across photographic eight, missions and those uh, those things. But did you uh, were you would you have been able to communicate fast enough so that the uh, the astronauts could have done something? Like that? Oh, we were on the same communications loop. Uh, we just picked up the same frequency. I didn't realize that. Houston, you are go for staging. This is the spectacular pluming. I think it really is unbelievable when you think of how big that booster is and how large that plume is. What's the sensation up there, uh, uh, Wally, when, when these events take place in, in space flight? Well, each one is a milestone, and we spend a tremendous amount of time training for the what we call the abort modes, which is where we terminate at certain fixed periods of time. And they're rather yeah, agonizing to miles, anticipate having to do that. So you like to tick them off. Uh, they occur at different intervals, uh, such as two and a half minutes, uh, three minutes, three minutes and 45 seconds, and you... As you pass each of these events, you, you get that one more milestone behind you, which means you're on the way to success. Do you actually check them off of a list, or just uh, mentally you know that you passed that point? You're, yeah, I'd say it's a mental checklist. Uh, you're, you're, the command pilot, uh, the mission commander, is really keyed up at this point because he's checking these abort modes as he goes down the pike, as we call it. Of course, when that escape tower jettisons, then you know that it's a, a flight task rather than a, an automatic uh, abort. Tower's gone. Roger, tower. Now, with this tower gone, they have the, the windows both clear so they can Engine see up to five windows. The launch escape tower separation. Before that, they can't see anything? Uh, only one window. This is where they're describing the visual simulation is up to date now. They can see something real out the window. <laughs> Just so we can have some windows to look at. That first flight of yours on Mercury must have been something when you had that first view, wasn't it? That, uh, I'll use the word fantastic, <laughs> it was. The, uh, that window is kind of interesting, by the way. When we started out in the uh, first Mercury that Al Shepard flew, the suborbital flight, we had windows were more like portholes on either side. And we had a seance where the seven of us got together and said, we need a window down the center line like airplane drivers have. Of course, ever since then, that window has become quite important because we maintain attitude with it. We restore attitude if we once dispense with it, either by tumbling inadvertently or tumbling by intent. So the window became quite worthwhile to us, and then now we do have a good view. It wasn't just a picture window to give you a view of the outside world. Uh, oh, no. There. No, by no means. We've had a, uh, uh, another uh, hack, as you spacemen call it. You're going to get me talking that way here, Wally. 
and nobody will understand us. <laughs> <laughs> the first hack on the orbit of the Apollo 11, uh, the term by the spacecraft is 116 by 119 statute miles, by mission control 117 by 114. I guess that's what we had come up with uh, uh, a little earlier, just about that. It comes out around 118 by 120, and that's just about on target, just about what they'd uh, hoped for, and it's certainly well within uh, the nominal range for successful mission. It's, it's kind of interesting in uh, Earth orbit uh, to elevate your orbit one mile only takes two feet per second. Now, when you think of the fact that they're flying around 25,000 feet per second, you don't need much more to change those numbers. No. Very, very small numbers involved here. They won't worry about changing it, though. They're perfectly happy. Oh, no, no, no. This, this is ideal. Uh, my palms are, are sweaty. That's, you are now a member of the mission launch team. <laughs> <laughs> Wally was telling me a little earlier that, uh, that he has found and checked it out that at precisely three minutes before launch, his palms become uh, sweaty. And, uh, and I check mine, and I think that uh, uh, I qualify uh, for an astronaut reading, at least on the wet palm index. Very well. CBS News color coverage of the launch day of Apollo 11 will continue in a moment. Three fellows who are remarkably alike in many ways, two of them 38 years old, one 39, all of about the same height, the same weight, roughly of the same physical description, Three men, civilian Neil Armstrong, 38, to Wapakoneta, Ohio, United States Air Force Colonel Edwin E. Buzz Aldrin, 39 years old, of Montclair, New Jersey, and 38-year-old Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Michael Collins, born in Rome, Italy, uh, his late father a general in the United States Army, as was his grandfather and as a brother. They are on the way to the moon. They were launched here from Cape Kennedy, pad 39A, which will forever be an historic mark. Uh, launched here at 9.32 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, precisely on time, exactly a half hour ago. They're now in orbit about the Earth, 118 miles high, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, approaching the coast of Africa on their first trip around the world. On their second trip, they will fire off their third stage engine again, and they will be on the way to the moon and man's first landing there. And here with me at our CBS News Space Center is the distinguished Vice President of the United States who is here to watch this launching in his role as the Chief of the uh, Space Council. Vice well, President Agnew, you, so good to see you, sir. Uh, and this was quite a launch, wasn't it? Indeed it was. Each one of them is quite a launch, but uh, I think the more you see, the more exciting they get. First one I've seen from the outside. It's even more exciting out there. Did it, was there anything about the launch that surprised you? Just that it seemed to go easier than the other two. Uh, I think you get to learn a little bit about the things that make you apprehensive, like the lean out when it starts. It scared the dickens <laughs> out of me the first time. <laughs> I know it does, doesn't it? And the slow climb, too, I yes. think it's, it's uh, frightening the first time you see it. Even though you know it's going to be that way, that you just can't believe that uh, it's really moving. You get that sense of uh, you're waiting for something to take off very quickly, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. But it was a beautiful sight. It was. It was indeed. And uh, I'm just filled with a, a real feeling of great pride for, for these people, not just the three men that are in the Earth orbit now, but the, the people behind the program. They're so dedicated. I, I just see a great future for this program. Out there, uh, when it went up, uh, there were tears in the eyes of many people, and we're told it's something that happens to you. There's an, a real emotional release as you, as you watch that thing go up, and, uh, and it must mean so much, as you suggest, to the thousands of people who are out here on this Cape who have put everything into this mission, who are the unsung heroes of it. Yes. I've had a chance to, to get to know some of the astronauts uh, because of being down for these shots, and I just want to say to the people in the country that these are the greatest, most dedicated men I've ever run into in or out of public life, military life, anywhere. They, they have a sense of uh, purpose, a sense of modesty that's uh, overwhelming, and, and they're so natural. They're, they're the greatest ambassadors we have, certainly. You know, it's the nature of the American and the people in the space program, particularly, to 
constantly look beyond where we are. Uh, this is uh, the nature of the man who wants to go to the moon. Uh, now we're on the way to the moon. We have high hopes for the success of this mission. It's not over by any means. We've gotten over the first big hurdle. We're out there in orbit. We've got a lot more to go. Landing on the moon hasn't been accomplished yet, and it's a tough job to do. But you were quoted as saying, uh, and everybody's looking forward what you're saying, as an indication of uh, what this administration's intentions will be towards space and beyond the moon.